In the United States, the date of 9-11 is indelibly associated with the terrorist attack in 2001. For Chilean people, however, 9-11 is associated with another tragedy, Pinochet military coup that took place exactly 50 years ago. On 9-11-1973, Pinochet's tanks overturned the democratically elected government of Salvatore Allende and seized the presidential palace. With no way out, President Allende committed suicide. The coup started 16 years of dictatorship, characterized by brutal violation of civil rights, massive repressions of liberties, and thousands of dissidents killed. After the coup, Pinochet called to his economic cabinets some young Chileans who had studied at the University of Chicago, the so-called Chicago Boys. The relationship between Chile and the University of Chicago started in the mid-1950s, when some students of the Catholic University were sent to study at the University of Chicago Economic Department. Returned to Chile, these young assistant professors changed the way economics was taught there. In 1969, they tried to advise the conservative candidate in the presidential election, but they were pushed away because they were considered too crazy. Their ideas became influential only after the coup, starting an experiment in neoliberalism. On the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the coup, we thought it was interesting to review this controversial legacy. In the rest of the podcast, we're going to focus only on the economic aspect of the Pinochet regime, where our expertise lies. Yet, first, we wanted to honor the innocent victims of the regime. I'm Bethany McLean. Did you ever have a moment of doubt about capitalism and whether greed's a good idea? And I'm Luigi Zingales. We have socialism for the very rich, rugged individualism for the poor. And this is Capital Isn't, a podcast about what is working in capitalism. First of all, tell me, is there some society you know that doesn't run on greed? And most importantly, what isn't? We ought to do better by the people that get left behind. I don't think we should have killed the capital system in the process. Today, we have a big announcement. Bethany has finally finished a new book, The Big Fail, what the pandemic shows about who American helps and who it leaves behind, which will come out in October. Looking forward to discussing it on the show. We need to think about actually how to do something special for the occasion, so we invite all the listeners to send us suggestions. Now, speaking of books, you have written many books, Bethany. I'm sure you had even more ideas for a book that you did not develop because you didn't have the time or because you thought that you were not the right person. I, I can answer that question better when it comes to stories. I've always felt that certain journalists who have first written about something have a claim on a story that I don't. So even if I think the story is really interesting and great and something that would otherwise be up my alley, if I weren't the one to break the original news about it, I've always had a, a harder time straying into what I what what I view as somebody else's somebody else's territory. I think you're much more disciplined than I am because uh, a few times I had some ideas and then I decided for various reasons not to pursue them. One of the instances where I finally saw somebody doing what I decided not to do, but doing much, much better, is this book called The Chile Project, The Story of the Chicago Boys and the Downfall of Neoliberals by Sebastian Edwards. As you know, in, in 1973, after the military coup, Pinochet called a number of Chilean students who study at the University of Chicago to direct the country's economic policy. And many of the recipes they introduce remain in place even after the end of the dictatorship. So much so that in Chile, this set of policy is known with, by the nickname El Modelo, the model. Now, on the one hand, this model had fantastic results in terms of economic growth. Per capita income grew more than six times in the last 40 years, making Chile the richest or the second richest country in Latin America. The fraction of people living below poverty line dropped from more than 50% to less than 5%. On the other hand, the country economic inequality remains astonishingly high. 28% of the total income is concentrated among just 1% of the population, making Chile one of the world's most unequal nations. Even in 2015, I could see sign of what is now called the malaise or in Spanish smallest star that brought the revolt that took place in 2019. Chile is a very stark example of both the positive and the negative effects of neoliberal policies and how neoliberal policies led to a populist backlash. In a sense, Chile is the purest form of something that has happened in the entire Western world. 
Not to mention the fact that there is a super interesting moral dilemma. Are you willing to help a brutal dictator like Pinochet, or should you not and leave the country fall apart? I'm also struck by how much of the discussion about the book or how much of what floats around, how much of the discussion of Chile and how much of what floats around in the ether is indeed ideological. You had George Shultz say, I guess at one point, which uh, somebody quoted in a review of of, of Edward's book, our Chicago boys produced the only really good economy in Latin America in the 1980s. It, It was sensational. And then you have, on the other hand, the sense that something really bad happened in Chile and that the takeover of the economy by the Chicago boys is is a negative. And I guess that was the assumption that I had that Chicago had done something really terrible to to Chile. Anyway, we'll we'll, we'll get to all of that. But Luigi, why didn't you write the book if you were so excited about this idea? Honestly, being from the University of Chicago, you can't win because you say something positive and people immediately say you are saying something positive because you are defending the University of Chicago. You say something negative and then people say, oh, you're trying to trash the University of Chicago, your, your employer in order to sell books. So there is no upside. So for this reason, I'm very happy when I saw that Sebastian Edwards wrote the book that I wanted to write. Sebastian, number one, is Chilean. And number two, he studied at Chicago. Now he's a professor at UCLA, but he's a close friend of the real father of the Chicago boys, who is Al Harbinger, who, by the way, is still alive at the age of 96 or 97. Now, in case this was not enough, uh, Sebastian had the credibility of somebody who opposed Pinochet as a young uh, student in Chile. In fact, he went to study at Chicago in 1977 because he was persecuted by Pinochet. Last but not least, he's also an acclaimed author of a spy book, El Misterio de las Tanias. I think I'm going to have to read his spy book, but but definitely it's impossible to match his credentials. And I think you and I are both lucky, whatever led us uh, not to write this book. I think this is a book that definitely should have should have waited for him. Um, but even even not knowing his credentials, I just I was really, really eager to to read this book because it seems to me that this question of neoliberalism, what it is, what its successes are, what its failures are, is an important question. And that Chile is, I'm not sure how to describe the canary and the coal mine, a very tell, perhaps, but a very telling uh, explication of some of the successes and failures of, of neoliberalism. And it's a big question for the world going forward. You're absolutely right. Uh, the most valuable contribution of the book is to describe what went wrong with the application of the neoliberal policies in Chile. But more generally, I think in the Western world. But before we enter into this discussion, I think we need to define neoliberalism because this has been used uh, very loosely as a term and seems to apply to most economies these days, from Milton Friedman to Larry Summers. So I think we should uh, really use the book to define neoliberalism. I think that's a great idea because, and I'm actually relieved to hear you say that even in your field of economics, it's been loosely used because I think journalists toss it around, and I will include myself under that label without having a clue what it what it what it actually means. And so, when I, I was really excited to read to read his definition and and think through it and some of the history of it as well. Anyway, Sebastian defines neoliberalism as quote a set of beliefs and policy recommendations that emphasize the use of market mechanisms to solve most of society society's problems and needs, including the provision and allocation of social services, such as education, old age pensions, health, support for the arts, and public transportation. Wow, pretty all-encompassing indeed. Luigi, do you agree with this definition? Yeah, but I prefer his second definition, which is uh, neoliberalism is the marketization of almost everything. As Sebastian points out, the crucial aspect is really in the term almost. However, I disagree with Sebastian because uh, he claims that this definition is able to distinguish a lot in the economy space, distinguish between, for example, Larry Summers and Milton Friedman. I don't think so. I think that both definitions will put everybody from Larry Summers to Milton Friedman under the same tent. And do you think that's right? They should be under the same tent? For what purpose? It depends on on sort of what you want to define and what you don't want to define. I think that uh, there is an element in which they have in common. uh, They have in common a very strong belief in market rules. I also would like to say they have in common a very distrust toward the need to give more power to ordinary people in influencing the shape of the economy. So there is a, a, a form of elitism that is present in both and is present in most economies these days.
That's interesting. Well, I'm really curious to hear what Sebastian has to say on a lot of these questions. So let's bring him in. Can we divide the period into Pinochet era and afterwards? So if we look at the 16 years of the dictatorship, the economic record is not that great. No, the economic record actually is very poor. When the military takeover, inflation is moving towards 2,000%. And the first task that the Chicago boys get from the military before they join the cabinet, they are just advisors, is make sure that we get rid of inflation. So they reduce inflation and inflation gets stuck in 74, early 75 at 400%. Why was it at 400%? It was at 400% because the military were very reluctant to privatize the most important companies, firms, industries that had been nationalized by Allende. The military are nationalistic, the armed forces in most countries, and they love the fact that they run now the refrigerator plant. They owned it. And they thought if we have a war with Argentina, we will produce tanks in these companies, which was, of course, a little absurd. So they were owning these companies and they run a huge deficit at that level, which was financed by the central bank by printing money. So what basically happened then is that Pinochet sides with the Chicago boys after a big infight and he uh, uh, stands against the more nationalistic um, members of the military and he privatizes all these firms basically for zero for very little pay. Why? Because they are losing companies, money losing companies. And he cuts, he tells tells the government to cut down on uh, government expenses. So the shock treatment comes in and that triggers privatization and the reduction of inflation. And that, I don't, I mean, if, if, if that had not happened, Chile would be today like Ecuador. So the the dictatorship, if you look at the records, it's in the book, it's poor, very poor, except that it starts to take off towards the end, after 85, 86. So there are four good years. And that is what Alejandro Foxley and his team, when they take over the economic leadership during the first democratic regime, they realize that this takeoff may last. And the Chilean miracle, in terms of statistical record, takes place during the concertacion governments, during demo- under democratic rule. And it is a true miracle. Okay, so let me just give you the one, the, the one example. When, we, when I was growing up in Chile in the 1960s and early 70s, we thought that it was totally, utterly impossible to surpass or even get close to Argentina on anything. Obviously, soccer, it was impossible. It still is impossible, but on anything. And by 2002, Chile had surpassed Argentina on everything except soccer. <laughs> so higher income per capita, uh, in, uh, higher uh, life expectancy, uh, better health, uh, 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 better uh, results in uh, education tests. I mean, anything that you look at, Chile surpassed Argentina. And that is regionally a miracle and also a miracle from, from all people. But to what Achilles heels was done under dictatorship, the initial and income distribution continued to be very unequal. But we know that pressure, especially exchange rate evaluation, etc., pressure countries to do stuff. In Italy, there was a huge uh, privatization wave in 92, 93, following precisely a currency crisis and so on and so forth. So many of the stuff you could get without a, a dictatorial regime so what is the unique stuff besides the craziness of pegging the interest, uh, the pegging the exchange rate, which led to a disaster? And I have to say, because in many situations, Milton Friedman and company were not particularly care, uh, caring about the institutions and how the institutions work. They were very much macroeconomists who understood very little of the, of the financial system. So for them, banks were kind of something that existed, but they didn't understand what they were. The fact that if you borrow in, in dollars and you land in pesos, if there is a massive devaluation, you are in crisis, you don't need a PhD to figure no. it out, right? <laughs> right? That's like Mickey Mouse economics, but no one has thought about it, at least not in Chile, right? No, but it, the, the biggest problem, in my view, is nobody had thought at, in the Chicago econ department. Who was suggesting them to pay attention to that? No one was suggesting to them to pay attention to that. Maybe Harberger told them, be careful. Uh, 
But I, I, you ask a, a very important question, which is besides the fixed exchange rate, what else was big mistakes? So what the military did is that they privatized the banks first. And they privatized them in a layer in, in layer wave fashion. So you could buy a bank, a big bank, paying down a million dollars, and you use your profits in the future to pay very slowly the rest. But what people did, the groups that bought those banks, is that they self-dealt credit to themselves and used the banks to buy the other firms that were being privatized after the banks had been privatized. So you, th 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 there were these conglomerates that were based on almost no equity. Everything was a, a pyramid of uh, paper companies. Um, and so the order of, liber of privatization became a very important topic. Do you, when do you privatize the banks? And if you do, how much do you regulate them? And the Mexicans learned about that, and they privatized the banks at the end. In Eastern Europe, they learned about that. They privatized the banks in some countries at the end, in some at the middle. In Russia, they privatized them right away, and it, as in Chile, it was at the basis of the oligarchs building these huge conglomerates and empires. So that was another mistake, no, I, and, and I agree with you, Luigi, non-regulating properly the banks, but in addition to that, this issue of sequencing of reform is very important. That's that's fascinating. I was going to ask you whether whether the problems in Russia with privatizations, what, what lessons they took away from Chile, and if they took away the right lessons, and it seems that the answer is 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 no. When you think about the mistakes that happened in Chile, how profound is this issue of of crony capitalism that the the, that the privatization question leads leads into? Is that the is that the founding sin? It is a serious, it's a very serious sin, and, and it's based on, 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 on very simplistic uh, economics. So the, the, the notion was, if we open the economy and we lower import tariffs from 500%, which basically meant that you could not import anything. If you lower it to 2% or 3% or 5%, you have foreign competition. And then the notion was, if anyone inside the country, two companies want to collude, someone will import the good from abroad and the collusion could not take place. And what they didn't realize is that you need a very complicated, complex supply chain structure to import. If you're gonna import TV sets, you have to have uh, warehouses, distributors, retail houses, and who became the importer of uh, Japanese TV sets and then Korean and then Chinese, the same guys who owned the uh, TV factories in Chile. So yes, there was foreign competition, but the margin was appropriated by the same people. So there was a very, uh, very simplistic view of the world. And I think that Luigi is right. No Chilean or Latin American economist, I, I would say, uh, in Chicago, that, that studied in Chicago at, at, during those years, took any courses in industrial organization. Uh, no one took Sam Peltzman. No one took even George Stigler, um, although if, and if they took him, they took, uh, they took a very simplistic view of the world from George. So, yeah, there were the regulation and understanding collusion and chronic capitalism and all of that was absent. But that added into what I tell in the, in the book at the end, all the abuses that paved the way to the demonstrations in 2019 and what I call the downfall of neoliberalism that we are observing uh, now uh, as we speak. You note that the founding definition of neoliberalism actually did explicitly encompass some social goals and some social good. How did those two things separate? How did neoliberalism in practice come to be so rigid and not to in include any social good? That's a great question, but I think that the answer is complicated. So you are absolutely right. The early neoliberal conversation is around Walt, uh, Walter Lippmann's book, uh, The Good Society. And what Lippmann says, if capitalism doesn't take care of some social concerns, we're going to be taken over by the Nazis or the fascists. And he's writing in 1937. Now, the Kolok Lippmann, there were 30, I think 36 people, all men, all white. Two Spanish philosophers were invited, but they didn't come. Not, no one was invited from uh, Latin America. There were two camps. One was Lippmann who wanted to put these social programs. And then the other one was Hayek and Mises, who were more, no, we need just to improve our competition. Lippmann then loses at the end, although there are no follow-ups to that meeting because of the war, Second World War. 
and the new group that re, uh, reassembles is the Mont Pelerin Society in 47, and it's only the right wing, the more conservative, the more extreme, if you wish. Now, in the case of the Chicago Boys, what happens is that they are worried about social concerns, but only about poverty. They want to eliminate poverty, but they don't care about income distribution. And, and, and that, I think, it's a crucial distinction. It turns out that income distribution is very important. And, and, and in, in societies, your relative position is crucial. And not only, as I say in the book, relative to income, also the way you are treated. And that I call horizontal inequality. And, and, and there's a lot of class distinction in a country like Chile, and also racial, although it's not made that explicit, but uh, people who are white and tall and have blue eyes have a great, are at a great premium relative to the average Chilean who is a mestizo or mestiza. So, Sebastian, you as a young uh, student were training Marxism, right? Yes. So what I'm surprised is that uh, you attribute everything to the battle of ideas and very little to the battle of economic interests. So all the Chicago boys, before then Chicago boys, they're part of the country club in Chile. And we know that there is a very small country club that runs the country. Whether you are from the so-called right or the so-called left, you belong to a country club. And so my question is, to what extent the, this Chicago boy story is kind of a facade? Because at the end of the day, yes, they pick it up what was in their interest, but what this guy wanted, wanted to push the interest of a small elite that control 99% of the wealth in Chile. And they did it very successfully. And they used the flag of Milton Friedman, but actually they didn't even follow Milton Friedman rigorously because the Castro pegged the interest rate when Milton Friedman was saying no. So I think that uh, it's not really that this guy were ideological. This guy were pushing their interest. No, I, I don't think that that, that, that is uh, accurate, uh, Luigi. At, at some level, you are correct. But w once you start digging, the, the several components of what you said um, uh, require some qualification. So the country club, as any country club, had cliques. Right? So there were the old aristocratic landowners. The Chicago Boys had almost none in that group. They were mostly new uh, migrant families, not very old in Chile. So Fontaine, uh, Rolf Luders, Pedro uh, Justa Heftanovich. So only one person belonged to the landed gentry, for instance. Right? And there were these cliques who were fighting with each other. You have to remember that the Chicago Boys pre wrote uh, an economic plan for the right-wing candidate in 1970, the fellow who lost against Allende, and this candidate, who had been the head of the manufacturing association, threw them out of the office because he said, you guys are crazy. You want to free prices, which we are very comfortable with control prices because we have in our pocket the people who control the prices. You want to free interest rates. We own the banks and we self-deal to ourselves. So we don't want to do that. You want to reduce import tariffs. No, we are protected by these huge tariffs because we own all the manufacturing factories. So they were not liked by the traditional conservative, the, the leaders of the country. So I think that that's, that that's not exactly the case. And the other thing where I would, I would qualify what you said is that at the end, Poverty, for instance, in poverty incidence was reduced from 58% to 8%. So it was very generalized, the, um, the benefit. It was not only lining the pockets of the rich. They did very well, don't get me wrong. And they became very much, much wealthier and income distribution improved, but very, very little. Very, very, very little. And that is and was a very serious problem. On that note, how did you come away thinking about this issue of income distribution versus reducing the goal of reducing poverty? We had Phil Graham on the podcast recently, and we were talking about some of these um, um, same, same issues. If you had to advise someone who is starting from scratch with a society, what would you say is important? Is it income distribution or is it, is it, is it poverty? Well, it's like the old SAT question, all of the above. I... I, I... <laughs> I spend a weekend with Phil Graham every year in Mexico. We talk economics and drink a lot of uh, tequila. And I, I've debated him on this issue. I think that his book is full of interesting facts. 
but he's mostly from a policy perspective, uh, he, I think that he's not correct. I think that uh, reducing poverty, of course, is very important. And once you accomplish that or get close to it, then income distribution is crucial. And not only income distribution, but also horizontal uh, equality, that people are treated with respect, that they are treated in a dignified way, that they get the same amenities. There is also the issue of, uh, with Luigi will understand, in Romance languages, there are two ways of treating people, either tu or usted, vous or tu, if in French. I don't know what the articles are in Italian. And so you see that young people that are from wealthy families treat in the familiar way, the two uh, uh, people who work there, the housekeeper and so on, and the, the housekeeper has to reply in the more respectful for, for fashion. So uh, it goes on and on and on and on, and, and income distribution is essential for stability, and that's uh, why t- today Chile is, uh, uh, we don't know where it's going. You write at the end of the book that free market proponents have really lost control of the narrative in Chile and elsewhere, that they've been silent, while others have been far more outspoken. Yet you also obviously detail all the mistakes that happened in, in, in Chile during the time of this, I don't know, I'll call it an experiment. So what's what's the relationship between the narrative and, and the reality? Or maybe a different way to ask that is, which pieces of the narrative should the free market type still celebrate and claim? Well, I think that the the, the narrative was uh, clearly uh, lost, and the left, uh, as I say in the in the in the group, after having lost this battle, they regrouped, they uh, licked their wounds, and uh, read uh, Gramsci. Basically, they le- read Antonio Gramsci. So uh, it's all uh, all happened through Italians, as usual. Uh, they read uh, they read Gramsci and uh, Judith Butler and uh, Habermas and and uh, Ernesto Laclau, and they realized that it had to do with uh, the ideology uh, at the end. And, and, and then they created this narrative that uh, the Chilean experiment was a failure. And I think that uh, the main aspect of that narrative that has to be captured is that it was not a failure, that it ran out of steam and had to be either changed and more regulation should have been introduced, better uh, role for the state, more uh, distributive policies, uh, um, anti-collusion measures, and so on and so forth. But the narrative that everything was a failure is just does not stand up to the data. And even if you go to the extreme of accepting Thomas uh, Piketty's data, it doesn't stand up to the data. Yes, income is very unevenly distributed. But the fact that the country moved from being the number 10 in Latin America, 10 out of 18, not 10 out of 200, right? So below the median, to be the number one by a wide margin is undisputable. The fact that poverty disappeared is undisputable. The fact that in human level indicators, human development indicators, Chile is the best country in Latin America, better than Argentina, better than Cuba. Many people say that Cuba has such a great health system. No. Chile number one on everything except soccer, that is undisputable. So that part of the narrative, accepting that it ran out of steam. You have to go to the next step, and the next step is to adopt all of these more social democratic policies with a greater role for the, for the, for the state uh, in, a, in, in an efficient way, but a greater role. And that is what, what, what the, the, the right did not understand. And, and, and the left uh, took advantage of the fact that they now control the narrative. But I think you are a little bit too generous by saying one's out of steam, because I think that planted some seeds that are difficult to change. In a sense, as you describe in the book, uh, a lot of people, for example, were sold uh, the hope that through a university education, uh, they will improve their well-being. But as we know from the paper you cite, and my ex-colleague says the Zimmerman document, that uh, in Chile, what matters is not uh, the degree you have, but who you are with at that degree. And if you come from the upper class and you go to University of Chile, you have all the contacts and you do very well in life. If you are uh, inquilinos and then you, you make it into the University of Chile, you don't make uh, a huge amount of money. So they were sold a fake dream, <clears throat> a dream that pretends to be egalitarian, but it's not. And I think that this is a fundamental problem. It's not just running out of steam. I think crash against 
the, the, the limit that were intrinsic. No, I, I, I think that we can, um, we, we agree with the facts. We agree that the old boy necktie is important. It determines the network and, and how well you do. But I think that you can call that uh, the inquilinos not earning as much as running out of steam. And you, you don't have to go back to a highly, regu highly regulated protectionist price controls regime to deal with that. There are many, many uh, ways you can do it, including what we do at the universities. For instance, we don't allow any more people to send a photo uh, of themselves when they apply, right? Which in a country like Chile is very important because, as I said, light skin is different from dark skin. You may want to have a regulation where firms uh, cannot ask about the high school. I mean, almost no one knows in this country, the U.S., which high school you went to. I mean, no, it's not an issue. It's not a question. You look at people's vitas. They don't say where they went to high school. In Chile, it's the first thing they tell you, those people who are part of the, the network. Okay? They tell you, I went to this uh, high school, a German priest or a French priest or a Holy Cross priest or no priest. But, but they tell Espirito you. Espirito Santo, Corpo Divino. Yeah. <laughs> As you, I mean, uh, uh, in 10 years... Uh, the, um, uh, higher education in Chile tripled in numbers. You could very well put in place regulations that make it more difficult to, uh, to, to, to have the, the old boys network um, operating. Uh, and, and, and I call that running out of steam. As you get to these higher stages, uh, you need to, uh, to put in place more regulations um, that, that make the system more meritocratic and work uh, better. But let me push back a bit on, on, on your previous answer, because putting some uh, affirmative action or, or more blindness in admission is certainly useful, but it's not going to fix the problem that if the economy is controlled by five families, if you went to school with those families, it's good for you. If you didn't, you are at a huge disadvantage, and that's the end of it. And even if you put all the blindness and mission tests, et cetera, at the end of the day, if I need to choose my board members, if I need to choose my next CEO, et cetera, do I prefer the guy I went to school with or do I prefer the guy I never met? I end up preferring the guy I went to school with. And so uh, all the intellectual class in Chile is basically dependent on the 10 families that run the country. And they, because also it's a small country, they are all together. And it's very difficult for anybody who is an outsider to come up. No, uh, uh, Luigi, I mean, we're not going to uh, 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 either disagree much on that. It is difficult, but not impossible. Um, there are measures and policies that are being discussed. You uh, rightly point out to the elite, uh, but let's talk about uh, the role of women. There is a notion that there should be quotas for women, women on boards, right? And I think that that's, uh, that's the right direction. And once you do that, uh, you may say, oh, they're going to put women from, <laughs> from the elite. Well, not necessarily, right? And, and the, the, the more advanced com companies have been adding women and have uh, half of the board or 40% or of the members being women. Many of them are not, are not coming from the elite. But but it's, it's, it's a slow process. And, and at the end, it's a question of, of cost and benefits. And I think that if uh, the three of us uh, uh, get together and we add maybe two more people over drinks and we drink some wine and eat some cheese, we can come up with a list of policies that would make sense. And I would, in general, not oppose them. What I would oppose is throwing all the progress uh, over the board in order to try to solve those issues. So I would rather have the problems, uh, which is a, in some sense an embarrassment of riches that, uh, that you are talking about, Luigi, than having Ecuador's uh, income per capita right now, which is one half, right? And, and, and I think that, that, that we can do this, and all we have to do is put our minds together to figure it out. Now, whether the elite will gladly accept it is a different issue, and of course they will resist it. <laughs>
So what are the broader implications of the Chilean story? To some degree, some of the problems you talk about are present in the United States, and, and, and to some degree. There are, there, are, there are differences, but from a two-tiered healthcare system, or multiple-tiered healthcare system maybe, to crony capitalism, to some of the problems with higher education and the lack of opportunity and students being having these monstrous overhangs of debt, and, and you have some of the same loss of the control of the neoliberal narrative taking place here. So what would you say the lessons are for the U.S. and for other countries? No, I think that one of the very important lessons, clearly for the U.S., has to do with something that may seem trivial, but I think it's not, which is that income distribution matters. So if you look at the Gini coefficient uh, in Chile is, uh, I don't know, 48, and in the U.S. is 42, and in uh, most of uh, Western Europe is 32, and in Eastern Europe is 28. So income distribution matters. It's like a, a pressure cooker and it, the pressure builds in, 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 and then it explodes. And that's what happened in 2019 in Chile, right? People did not understand it. It's a paradox. How come that the number one country in Latin America goes in flames and they burn out 25 uh, metro stations in one night and so on and so forth? So income distribution is of essence and corporate abuses, chronic capitalism, uh, creates a loss in faith in the system that is very difficult to get back. And you build in all this resentment that at the end may result in a uh, much worse system. So there, there, there is, for instance, the danger that uh, we end up in a highly protectionist uh, system. Why? Because uh, one of the uh, bases of the neoliberal model was uh, joining globalization. And if it, we think that the whole system is bad, the whole model is atrocious, then you put in import tariffs and Chile with 18 million people starts uh, producing seven different brands of automobiles, uh, each of which will cost $70,000, which is where we were just 30 years ago. Now, Sebastian, the last question. You were, as you said, a bit too young to be among the Chicago boys that really changed Chile. Suppose you had been born a few years earlier and you had gone to Chicago. You are asked by Pinochet to do what De Castro and other people did. Would you have done it? Never. My generation, we were 20. Just, I, just, I had just turned 20 when the coup came. And my generation, we were all between 19 and 20. And the dictatorship was for 16 years. Many of my comrades in arms from the left ended up taking jobs with the Pinochet government, because it was very long. If you worked for the government, you had to work for and accepting money to go to grad school. I never accepted or received a single peso, dollar, or anything from the Pinochet government. I would never, ever, ever have done it. There were other Chicago-trained economists uh, of the first generation that also stayed out and were part of the opposition to Pinochet. So I would not have been the only one, but I would... I. I am very proud of the fact that I was always on the other side of the road. Sorry, I know they are ready to go, but I wonder, it's too, too hard not to ask you a follow-up question, which is, how do you judge the people who did it, and was it worth it? It's very hard for me to do that. I have a whole section in the book which asks the question, did the Chicago no boys know about the violation of human rights? They say they do didn't. They knew something because when the Pinochet agents killed, assassinated former ambassador Orlando Letelier in Washington by blowing up his car, of course they knew because it was on the papers everywhere. And they knew of other things. It's tough to justify. It's tough to justify. The way they justify it, including Friedman, is uh, we are doctors. And this was a patient that was about to die, the Chilean economy with GDP declined by 10% during the last Allende regime, inflation 200%, shortages, black markets, and so on. And we were called in and we worked like doctors. I find that difficult, but I prefer not to judge them. But my, judge them. But my position is I never did it. I would never have done it. And um, I never, ever, ever, ever. Thank you. This was fascinating. This was great. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.
If you're enjoying the discussions Luigi and I are having on this show, there's another University of Chicago podcast network show you should also check out. It's called Not Another Politics Podcast. Not Another Politics Podcast provides a fresh perspective on the biggest political stories. It's not told through opinions and anecdotes, but rather through rigorous scholarship, massive data sets, and a deep knowledge of theory. So if you want to understand the political science behind the political headlines, then listen to Not Another Politics Podcast, part of the University of Chicago Podcast Network. As a journalist myself, I can tell you how important it is for reporters, especially business reporters, to develop a deeper understanding of the subjects we're covering. The Stigler Center's Journalist in Residence program offers paid training in the fundamentals of economic and business at the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. And there are other perks. Learn more and apply now at chicagobooth.edu slash StiglerJIR. Overall, I think that he's very compelling as an author and as a speaker. I thought so too. I had trouble putting the book down. Actually, I, I thought it was I thought it was fascinating. I think it's incredibly topical today, not just because it's topical to what's happening in Chile, but it's topical to what we're all talking about, which is what are the limits of, of neoliberalism. And I think while Chile may offer extreme examples of a lot of these problems, they're present in a lot of countries, including including the United States, and there are absolutely lessons to be to be to be learned to be learned from this. One of my favorite favorite of his observations is this notion of malaise or, or malstar, that economic success isn't just about the actual numbers, but about but about emotions, like the relationship between blue collar workers and elites and about the shame and humiliation that capitalism connects to poverty. And that had some interesting, interesting connections to our discussion with Michael Sandel about about meritocracy, that when you're told that if you if you succeed, it's only due to your own steam. And if you fail, it's all your fault, that you create these these fault lines in society. I thought it was really interesting and should be almost required reading for, <laughs> for, for our Congress or for anybody who's shaping economic policy in the U.S. Absolutely. And uh, what I found particularly fascinating is the episode that he tells about Hal Harbinger, who is the father of the Chicago Boys, who the first time, one of the first time he goes to Chile, ends up uh, in one of the fancy clubs of the Chilean elite and then asks the questions, how many people here are children of uh, what are called inquilinos that tend to be basically farmers without that who don't own any land in 1956 or whatever was the first time they fell off the chair because they couldn't even think about the possibility that somebody could emerge from uh, being a simple farmer to actually being an owner and and uh, a, a wealthy man now he redid the same question, re-asked the same question, I think 10 or 15 years ago, and the people fell for the chair a little bit less. But the answer is still nobody. I also thought what was really interesting is not just that income distribution is really key to whether a society is stable or not, um, whether or not you've succeeded in eradicating poverty. I think that's a really, really, really key observation. But also that the way in which poverty was addressed in Chile left the people who are right on the margin of poverty in constant fear because they couldn't feel stable because they had they had no 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 support. And I think that 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 broader sense of in instability, of slippage, of the possibility of making one wrong step and falling off a cliff is is also part of what went wrong in Chile and part of what worries me about where we are in, in, in the U.S. right now. There's that same feeling of fragility, that, and I think it permeates all aspects of society, that if you make a misstep, if your child doesn't get into the wrong school, your, the right school, your fragile hold on this thing called the economic ladder is going to, is going to slip, and you're, in, and you're going to fall and, and crash and never be able to pick yourself back up again. And I, that, that, that broader, that, I, just, I just think it's really fascinating to think about that malaise as, a, as an emotion that exists in a society, regardless of how well the numbers might say that the overall society is doing. Yeah, I think you're raising a good point. I don't know to what extent is the result of him being part of uh, the Chilean elite or what is, uh, is the result of him being trained as a macroeconomist and uh, not really knowing the more micro mechanisms that drive many of these uh, uh, results. Because uh, he was very clear in saying that all the Chilean were coming to study here were studying uh, macroeconomics. 
And I can sympathize with that because all the Italians who are going abroad up to my generation were studying microeconomics. Why? Because you come from a country with enormous macroeconomic instability. So the first order of magnitude is that if you have inflation at 2000%, then anything else becomes second order, right? And so all the Chileans have been trained as macroeconomists and they have ignored the microeconomic problems. And maybe as a result of this ignorance, they let a lot of uh, rules or lack of rules that favor incumbents or favor here, favor there, without paying too much attention to that. So the, the kind of market rules they introduce is a market rules without rules, uh, is an unregulated market that doesn't work very well. It favors tremendously who is incumbent, who has an advantage to begin with. I think that's a fascinating observation, and I liked your observations about that when we were talking to him and your, your, your question for him, because I, I tend, at least simplistically, to think about management of an economy as, as monetary monetary models. And you realize when you look at Chile how important all these other elements like regulation and and how you privatize. I thought his comments in the podcast about the order of privatization of when, when you privatize the banks were fascinating. And the parallel between um, Chile and Russia is really, really, really interesting. It just made me, made me think basically that if you were, were going to take an economy and build it from scratch or you were going to start again with Chile, that wow, is this complicated and is there an awful lot to think about? And it really isn't just as simple as saying free market switch, let's go, right? Absolutely. And to some extent is a shortcoming of the profession that uh, we didn't uh, study fast enough the Chilean model because it would have been uh, very useful for the subsequent privatization in Russia and all the Eastern Bloc. There was some understanding, but not enough because, uh, as he said, the mistakes were repeated. Is there a trade-off between economic growth and equality? In other words, can you have one without without the other? Or does the huge economic success that we saw in Chile, broadly speaking, automatically bring with it a kind of inequality until basically society catches up, if society catches up before it blows up and says, oh, no, 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 we, we, we can't have this. But I was thinking about this relative to our conversation as well with Darren Asimoglu about his book and about how how we equate free market policies with this huge, huge, huge economic growth. And maybe the two, maybe it's just correlation and, and, and not causation, and that there are all these random factors that have caused society to, to catch up. But I thought, how do you think about that? How do you think about this relationship between economic growth and equality? Can you have one in an extreme fashion without the other? If you have huge economic growth, does it automatically bring with it at first, uh, at least at first, a dramatic increase in inequality as well? Certainly, especially on the upper end of the distribution, a huge growth creates opportunities for making a huge amount of money. And so it does create a right tail in the income distribution. It's very hard to imagine that this doesn't take place. However, you can do much better than Chile. And remember, Chile started with a very high income inequality. The income inequality and wealth inequality went up under the first year of Pinochet. And only later it started to improve a little bit, but not very much. And there is still very little fiscal redistribution because uh, as uh, we discuss uh, with Senator Graham, there is the pre-tax income distribution and there is the after-tax and transfer income distribution. Chile does badly even in the pre-tax one, but does terribly in the after-tax one because there's very little redistribution at all. And, and that's part of the legacy of the policy in place. So I think with a little bit of more fiscal distribution, you could have had a, a, a better system. But what at least to me is particularly offensive is that there were a lot of mechanisms where people got rich without deserving to be rich. So if you make a patent, you have a new business model, you make a lot of money, I am sympathetic to you becoming rich. But let me tell you that a lot of the people close to the Chicago boys got rich, for example, doing a trick around the restriction that universities should be non for profit. So the law says universities are private, but should be non for profit. So what did they do is they bought a bunch of real estate, then they created a university that was uh, sort of uh, renting from that real estate, and then were extracting all the profits as uh, uh, real estate owners rather than as universities. 
And so they did become rich, basically, by passing the law and taking advantage of the fact that they knew ahead of time much of the, the regulation so that they could do it uh, before anybody else. I don't see that as a particular entrepreneurial activity. No, I completely agree with you. And I've always had much, much the same set of beliefs, which is that if somebody actually creates a business, something new that provides jobs to other people and provides goods that people want, I have no problem at all with that person making an enormous amount of money. The problems in society come when people make money through unfair mechanisms, through crony capitalism. Or I was thinking about, do you remember the piece Matt Stoller wrote about called the Kentian effect? And I'm probably mangling the pronunciation of it. And you might be able to define it for our listeners better than I can. But I think it basically means that if you're close to the source of the money, that you can get rich. Basically, you want to position yourself close to the source of the redistribution and that that enables you to succeed in a way that has nothing to do, speaking of meritocracy, nothing to do with a meritocracy. It just happens to be due to your positioning in the economy or the social structure. Did I did I mangle that? And do you agree that the Cantillon effect? No, I think you describe it perfectly. It's, called, it's Cantillon in French. Oh. But, uh, well, uh, besides I'm, that, I'm an ugly, I'm an ugly <laughs> Midwestern, Luigi. We've <laughs> but besides that, I think you describe it perfectly. It. <laughs> and, and I think you're right that uh, in, Matt Stoller uses it for monetary policy, but it's true for any policy. How much wealth depends on uh, where you are, uh, not what you do, I think is scary. And to this point, you know that nine of the 10th wealthiest counties in the United States are in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Wow. That is um, <laughs> that is quite appalling. That is quite appalling. So do you think also, more, more broadly speaking, do you think that when, when we talk now about the downfall of neoliberalism, is Chile the canary in the coal mine for neoliberalism as, as a whole? And if it is, is, is that a good thing? So let me redefine it, because in my view, is a narrow version of liberalism where you don't factor in the need of regulation. You don't factor in the fact that markets are not automatically competitive and that you need antitrust and so on and so forth. So let's call it the old Chicago version of liberalism. The old Chicago version of liberalism worked very well in improving income for a while, but has very strong limitation, especially as you move out of the traditional business sector and you want a more complex economy. So if you are basically producing wine, grapes, and copper, which is mostly of what, and fish, uh, which is mostly of what uh, Chile is about, that works perfectly well. If you are in the more advanced technology, I don't think that that simple system works so well. And even in, in a more traditional economy like Chile, shows all its limitation and needs to be addressed. So in, in that, Sebastian is right, that is showing that you should change the model, but not change it completely. So my preferred thing is to say you should have policies that are pro-market and not pro-business in the way that most of the traditional old Chicago school uh, policies were about. And, and I think in that sense, Chile is the canary in, in, in the coal mine. I think that makes total sense. I think you also have to build in safeguards, though, because I think as became clear in our discussions about meritocracy and is clear here, too, the advantages conferred upon a certain group of people by a market-based society will lead them to entrench those advantages for themselves through crony capitalism, for their kids, through what we might, we might call crony education. Um, and I think that's, that's, that's the challenge, is that not only do you have to set up the system in, 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 in the first place, so that it's pro-market and not and not pro-business, but you also have to constantly re revisit it. And I really liked that quote. I don't have it in front of me right now. I'm going to have to try to pull it up. But I really liked that quote from um, Sebastian's book about how people who win the battle of ideas think they've won, and they don't realize that they've only won in the moment, and that the battle of ideas is ongoing, and you can have won it in one moment, and you can lose it um, in, in the next moment. And that's certainly true of, of neoliberalism. But I think it's also true that you can think you've put in place a structure that makes sense and works, but within any structure is the seeds of its own demise or the seeds of its own failure. And so you have to revisit that structure all, all the time. It's not enough to have done it. You have to keep doing it. Capitalism is a podcast from the University of Chicago Podcast Network and the Stiegler Center in collaboration with the Chicago Booth Review. 
Also check out promarket.org, a publication of the Stiegler Center. The show is produced by me, Matt Hodap, and Leah Cesarine, with production assistance from Utsoff Gandhi, Sebastian Burka, Chris Wheat, and Brooke Fox. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a review for Capitalism wherever you get your podcasts. 